Welcome to Ion Innovation, brought to you by the OAS Podcast. I'm your host, Carrie Powers, and we're here at the OAS Conference in San Diego, listening to the latest and greatest um, innovations in ophthalmology. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing five mistakes to avoid in your biotech investor pitch deck. My guest is Dr. Rob Rothman founding partner of InFocus Capital Partners and also clinical assistant professor of ophthalmology and a partner at OCLI. And I should also say, Dr. Rothman is also another one of the OIS podcast hosts. So this is a very new experience for him today to be on the other side of the interview. So welcome to the OIS podcast. Thanks, Carrie. I am much more comfortable sitting in that chair <laughs> than this chair, but I am happy to be here today and hopefully uh, you know, have an interesting discussion. Well, we've got a room full of biotech founders and CEOs over here, all hot on the trail of some funding. As we all know, it's been a really tough year out there raising capital. And so I think that this is a subject they'll be really interested in hearing about. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen a number of bad pitch decks in your day. Um, I think 18 years of experience now in venture capital. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a lot. It's been a lot of years. <laughs> Almost 20 years, correct. Okay, so I uh, would love to hear uh, five mistakes to avoid. And you were kind enough to give me the cliff notes on these earlier. So we'll start with mistake number one, and that is presenting a generic DAC to a specific investor. So tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that. So I, I, think, I think it's an interesting time for raising capital in the venture space right now. It is a weird climate for raising capital in general. And there are a lot of companies who have survived COVID and have survived all these um, economic crises that are going on, high interest rates, multiple global conflicts, and they need money. And with interest rates what they are and capital markets what they are, the opportunities for them to raise capital are somewhat limited. And you don't need to give an investor a reason to say no. And a bad pitch deck is going to ultimately not even get you any real exposure. I've seen hundreds of pitch decks uh, over the past few years as we review opportunities as investors. I also have had the opportunity to produce a pitch deck of my own when I raise capital, which is something that's going on now. And as it relates to the first mistake, um, you need to know who you're presenting to. Generic decks don't work. You can't have one deck when you're going out raising capital. There, I am an ophthalmologist. I invest in ophthalmic technology. Uh, if you're coming to me to raise money, you should not have a deck with four slides on the opportunity in glaucoma. I kind of understand the opportunity in glaucoma. And if you don't know who I am as an investor, it's not gonna weigh well with me. If you're going to a financial institution to look for capital, and you should know where they've invested before. Have they invested in this space? Are they familiar with an ophthalmic opportunity? Or if you're not an ophthalmology investor, are they familiar with the opportunity that you're presenting in general? And if they are, spend less time on that. Acknowledge their previous uh, investment in the space. And if there's somebody who are completely naive, acknowledge that as well, and then spend a little bit more time. So one pitch deck is rarely gonna cover everybody who you're speaking to. Makes total sense. It's a, just like preparing for a job interview. You know, who, know who you're talking to before you walk in. So. Right. One, I, I'll give you an example. One, one time I had, you know, I, I have a partner in, in the fund and we have a big key opinion team. And uh, one of the investment companies came to us with a deck. And during the presentation of that deck, spent a specific amount of time highlighting the accomplishments of their advisory board. Three of their advisors were members of the InFocus team. <laughs> which is information that's readily available. Oh, right. So, and I said, you know those guys are part of our investment team. They said, no, well, guess what? That's bad, that's, <laughs> that's not a good thing. So I think as it relates to that first point about generic deck, I think the, the real message there is know, know who you're presenting to. Ha be flexible with your, with your marketing and make sure that it's tailored to the specific group who you're talking to. Got it, makes sense. So mistake number two, uh, the overuse of hyperbole and overestimating <laughs> the value of an asset. So how does a company strike the right balance between building the value story without losing credibility on overestimating? Well, it's, it's you know, I don't, I don't think it's that difficult to be honest with you. I, I, I think the problem that a lot of 
founding scientists or owners of uh, entities fall into is they look at the ultimate value of their potential asset and say, well, for example, the treatment of dry macular degeneration is a $50 billion opportunity, so our company's worth $800 million, <laughs> except you have no proof of concept or human data, right? Mm -hmm. So there are conversations that, that I have had as an investor with companies who have presented to us decks with valuations which were so far from where they were in the clinical development pipeline that you know that there's no discussion that can occur where you're going to be able to meet at a, at a, reasonable, a reasonable valuation. Okay, so if you say that you're worth a billion dollars because every opportunity is worth a billion dollars, but you haven't even put your concept into a human patient yet or validated it, you're just going to turn people off. And that's ultimately what happens. Again, you don't need to give me a reason to say no. There's plenty of reasons to say no. And fortunately, there is lots of opportunity out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's hundreds of companies that have great potential for becoming real assets down the road. I need to be able to engage in a meaningful discussion with a realistic team that understands that their future asset may be worth a billion dollars, but right now they've raised a million dollars and they're really worth maybe five million or 10 million or something like that. And we have walked away from deals where founders were unwilling to be um, flexible on their valuation and it just didn't make sense for us as an investment. So hyperbole as it relates to your own valuation, I think is, 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 is critical. And again, I think when you're presenting to, to maybe a, uh, an entity that isn't as familiar with the space in which you're, you're uh, presenting, and, you know, a, a large venture capital firm that doesn't have a lot of life science investment but may want to get into the life science space, may not know as much about it, you can't present the total addressable market as every single person on the planet. Right, so I think you just need to make sure that things are realistic because big numbers tend to frighten investors. Yeah, absolutely, that makes perfect sense. So the third most common mistake that you've identified, and this I see this all the time, too long, too wordy, uh, what's the longest pitch deck you've ever seen? <laughs> well, you know, I don't even, I, I can't tell you because by the middle of it I probably fall, you know, <laughs> yeah. fell asleep and just, and just turned it off. You know, there's, there's two things that are gonna happen. Um, the first outreach that you have as a company is your deck. And if you want people to read it, you have to treat it like any other piece of material that they may get. Nobody wants to sit down with War and Peace for a nice, uh, enjoyable evening, right? Uh -huh. you, you need to have something that's engaging, that's succinct, that is clearly uh, and, and properly put together so that the message is clear. Um, and you can't expect us to sit and read a thousand words on a slide. The deck is an opportunity for you to get to the next step which is telling the story, right? Giving people the information that they want and having your questions answered. You want to be engaging in your deck. You want it to be something that's eye-opening. Eye Imagine if you were walking down the street looking at movie billboards, and instead of just a really great picture of what was gonna happen in there, there was a list of the first two pages of dialogue <laughs> from the script, from the, the, no one's gonna stop and read it, right? They, they want it to be engaging, and, and I think it, it means utilizing people, for example, like yourself, who produce the proper marketing materials for the target investor. That's, that's kind of what you have to do. So, you know, what number is the right number? There's no answer. You've got to be able to tell your story. You've got to be able to highlight key things. I think you should have two versions of a deck at a minimum. One is the short form and one is the long form mm -hmm. because people are going to ask you if they like the short form about things that you should anticipate and have in your long form deck. So, again, it goes back to having the proper information presented. but. Don't put too much information on the slide. Don't put too many words on the slide. Get your point across quickly, because remember, the way that you present the deck ultimately represents what you're going to be like as an investment partner should they choose to work with you, and people want efficiency. Mm -hmm. So if you're not efficient in your deck, I think they're going to have a difficulty believing you're going to be efficient with your capital. This quote has been attributed to many different people, but um, one of them is Mark Twain. If I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. <laughs> um, and, and we cancel clients on that all the time. It's important to be concise and uh, just really get to the point. You're quickly, being judged so. on your deck. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the bottom line is, is how you present that deck is basically a, how you present yourself. And, and again, if, if it's not, if I can't get the message quickly and if it's not an efficient use mm -hmm. of my time and, 
then I got to assume that you're going to treat my capital that way as well. And that's just not the way you begin a relationship. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Mistake number four is not addressing the challenges or competition. And that actually kind of shocks me. Do you really get pitch decks that don't even? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And you know, some of it is, I don't, it's not always the worst thing in the world. Um, people are excited, you mm -hmm. know, the, 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 the people that we work with and the, the founders and the scientists who, um, who present their, their companies to us are genuinely um, engaged. If mm -hmm. we don't feel that sense of engagement, we don't, we don't talk to you. But sometimes you just forget that you're so excited about what you're doing and what the opportunity is, you forget that the people that you're presenting to actually are making an investment. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things that I've said many times, you know, in public forums, and that is that as much as investors like us and others are interested in propagating really meaningful and important science, we're not charities and we have to anticipate what the return is going to be and for us to do the type of analysis that we need to do we want to understand what you think the competition is we're going to do our own assessment but we want to know what you think the challenges are what you think the competition is like out there you know the SWOT analysis is something that's referred to on a regular basis you know what are your strengths what are your weaknesses what are the opportunities and what are the threats mm -hmm. and if you don't have those addressed in your deck it's gonna it's gonna sort of represent that you may not have a full understanding of what the future for your company is in terms of its development because you've got to address those at the onset. Mm -hmm. uh, mistake number five is not telling the story. So what does that mean to you and how do you convey that to a CEO? You know, and I've, and I've discussed this with other investors and, and some, some people care and some people don't care, but for me personally and for my fund and a lot of the funds that we interact with um, as investment partners, Remember that the deck is a way for you to tell investors not only why you think you're a good investment, but how you got to the place that you're at. There is a story behind every single one of these companies. I have a story. It's like seven days long. It would take me 100 hours to explain how I ended up being a glaucoma specialist and now a venture capital investor, but there's a story there. And I can tell it to you in two minutes, in 12 minutes, 22 minutes, or you know, two days uh -huh. if you want. Um, you, know, you have to have all of those options. There's, the story is critical because if we can't understand how you ended up with the asset that you have and how you're moving it forward, we can't, we have to, we don't, we don't know the history. We don't know where it's come from. We don't know how committed you are to it. We don't know what the motivation is for it. There is a personal story behind some of these. There's a, a, a particular founder here who, who we love, um, who went out and found an asset um, to treat her own disease. Right? Wow, and that's she invested in, in an asset to treat her own disease. That is an amazing story. Uh -huh. And if you give me that information at the onset and you tell me that that is a backdrop to why you're moving forward, I understand from that how engaged you're going to be in this process. I okay? love and, that. And it's, and it's a critical piece of information. You can't always tell the whole story in a deck. But what you want to do, like any other piece of marketing, is engage the reader so that they want to call you back to hear that story. Mm -hmm. I want to get you on the phone after I read that information in your deck and say, how did, this, how did you get here? What do you mean this is something personal to you? Or how, you know, it's important because all of that is critical. When we evaluate an opportunity for investment, the first three check boxes in our diligence list are management, management, and management, mm -hmm. right? You've got to know the people you're working with. There's a story for each of those managers. These companies came from somewhere. We want to know what that history is. Mm -hmm. And I think every investor wants to know what it is. Okay, so we promised our listeners five mistakes. If I could be so old, so bold to add a sixth mistake to sure. the list, I think an often overlooked area is reimbursement okay. and, and understanding that path to coverage. So what level of detail um, in that area specifically are you looking for in an investor deck? Well, again, you know, I think it goes back to the thoroughness of the review process at, at every level for an investment. And one of the things that's critical for us as an investor is to guesstimate, or at least have some idea, as to what the likelihood of your asset becoming a commercially viable product is. You know, are you gonna be able to enter the market um, and actually make money? There are some of the greatest ideas in the world that won't generate proper return um, as an investment. And as much as that's hard to navigate for us because we love the companies that we invest in, we have to be able to provide a return for investors. The biggest challenge outside of science is understanding what's gonna happen with reimbursement as we just saw what happened in, in, in this country at mm -hmm. least. You know, the entire minimally invasive glaucoma surgical market just got hammered 
um, and cause significant disruption in not only clinical preference, but also in people's livelihood. People lost jobs as a result of CMS regulation changes regarding reimbursement for, for certain glaucoma procedures. And that's a hard thing to predict, but you've got to, under, you've got to at least acknowledge in your deck that this is the current reimbursement landscape for this. This is what we think makes sense in terms of pricing for our product in the future. And this is how we intend to address potential changes in that strategy over time. It's challenging for a company that's presenting to me in 2024, let's say, because it's 2024 effectively, um, and who may not have a clinical product based on their best case scenario until 2028, what the reimbursement's gonna be like at that point in time. But you at least gotta acknowledge what it is now, what uh -huh. the market looks like now, what your competitors are, are, are getting paid, and wh what, what you think. Orphan drugs, pretty easy. You can set your price, right? And you know, you can reach, but if you're gonna enter a currently occupied space with, with uh, opportunities that are already being reimbursed, it's gotta be acknowledged. It is the most overlooked piece of every deck. It's a failure to address um, what the reimbursement could look like and what the likelihood of, uh, of reimbursement is. That includes coding and whether or not it's going to need novel coding or whether there's an existing code that satisfies um, what, what you have as an asset um, and also the reimbursement for that. Um, it's, it's, it's something that you need to address. And again, when there is no assessment of that, it leads us to believe that you haven't thought about the lifespan mm -hmm. of your company, about the longevity of the company from beginning to end. When you go out and raise money, you may be raising money for C or C or AA, but we're investing for return. And that may encompass a much longer period of time. So you need to address every stage of what you think you're gonna to need to do. When we ask you how much money you're gonna need, we don't ask you how much money you're gonna need for today. We wanna know what you're gonna need over the life of that company. And when somebody's gonna buy you at the end of this process, that they're gonna buy you based on the value they think your asset is, and that requires you understanding what the, what the reimbursement is gonna be for you. So. Yeah, very good, very good. I think all that's super practical information that everybody here in this room needs to listen to. Um, well, ophthalmology I think is great in general. I think most ophthalmologists have heard us say similar things Things like this uh -huh. over time, but, you're, but you'd be surprised. There are there are new entities every day. Some of them uh -huh. just miss, you know, and they're not used to it. And hopefully, they'll learn um, over time when they hear some feedback. Uh -huh. uh, I, we usually, and again, this may just be to us, when we say no, we give feedback. Why? Or what's missing? Try and do some education along the way if we can and help people. But um, you're right. I think that um, probably the best way to avoid some of these mistakes is. Hire a good marketing person. Uh, I love I mean, it. It's really, I mean, yeah. I'm not just saying it because you're interviewing me. <laughs> it's like, spend a little money on your marketing because mm -hmm. that's really what people are going to see. I think as we you know, think back through these mistakes, really the headline is tell a very complete story. Um, but don't do it too, in a, yeah. Uh, yeah, do it concisely. So. Right. Complete, right. concise story, Complete, that's the answer. Complete, concise story, yeah. so awesome. Well, thank you so much My for pleasure. spending time on the other side of the interview today. Really appreciate Happy it. Happy to do it. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for asking me. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed that, and thank you for tuning in to the OIS Podcast. I'm your host, Carrie Powers. If you have ideas for future topics for the OIS Podcast, email us at oas at healthogy.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.